Welcome Wargamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough, and I have been doing lore videos for about five years, and all of them have kind of been the same. Um, they just have, you know, text, or speech, I should say, rather, over, you know, Games Workshop art and things like that, and that has been done to death by multiple channels, and I've covered the lore for every army. So, as I kind of want to go back and refresh and re-dive into some of the nooks and crannies that make each faction unique, I wanted to change it up. More importantly, I want your opinion on this, so that's why this little pre-ramble is here. Instead of just artwork that just kind of comes and goes all the time and just kind of gets repetitive, I'm actually going to be painting a sequitur on screen with you. So I'm going to switch to that camera I have set up. Um, the reason I need your feedback on it is because if you like it, I'm going to get a much better camera, like the webcam setup that I have. Um, with a higher resolution, frame rate, that kind of stuff, if you like the style of it. So again, can't stress enough, please let me know whether you're subscribed or not, I would really enjoy it. I just want to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over on Patreon and the folks who support me by becoming a member here on YouTube. Um, again, this whole reinvention is just trying to find new ways to connect, to grow, to hang out with you guys, so please leave me your feedback. Without further ado, let's learn about these guys in the Sacrosanct Chamber. So kicking off our discussion on the Sacrosanct Chamber, I think there's a few things we need to really discuss. So the first is, what was life like before them, right? We're trying to get a sense of what they really brought to the armies of Sigmar in general, and then we'll talk about kind of how they do that and all those other fun details. So before the Sacrosanct Chamber really, really came through into fruition, there wasn't really any, to be, like, really speak of, magic within the Stormcast Eternals faction. They really just were hurting for wizards in pretty much in every single way. That was sort of, for a long time, thought to sort of be their balancing factor. Like that they have all these cool warriors and that kind of stuff, oh, but they lose access to some powerful magics and stuff. Well, that really wasn't the case, as many of us soon found out, because the Sacrosanct Chamber is what brought that. Now before them, as I mentioned in before, the, the Stormcast armies were mostly made from the warrior chambers. That is to say, lots of paladin units and uh, liberators and that kind of stuff. You know, more traditional Stormcast things at the time anyway. And those guys were doing really well for quite a while. You know, they, they had pushed sort of the initial chaos forces for the most part back and then kind of secured a, a bit of landscape, if you can, for the forces of order, but there was a problem at that point in time, and that was with one surly character named Nagash, the Lord of Undeath. You see, Nagash was not too happy that the forces of order were trying to make a comeback. He didn't like working with them. Uh, he felt like he was getting the raw end of the deal when he was back with the Pantheon of Gods before Chaos re-entered the area, and so he was like, no, 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 I don't want to go back to the way things were. I want to be in charge. And so he puts in play his plan called the Necroquake. It takes, you know, hundreds of years to do, but essentially it is a spell that he wants to cast that is going to do two exact things. First, it's going to kill everybody, right? If you're living in the mortal realms, you're dead now. And the second thing it's going to do is bring all those dead people back to life, specifically under Nagash's will. Now, that's an interesting concept, right? Because it's on the surface, it's actually a really solid plan. The chaos gods require the emotions and temptations and excesses of mortals to be able to survive. And so if you cut off their food supply and the things that they can corrupt and basically make the mortal realms to the point where the chaos gods have no influence or frankly just don't want them, well then heck, you know, Nagash can actually solve you know, the capital C chaos problem. And so on surface level, it's like, well, you know, it's a bad plan in the sense that kind of it's a villainy plan, right? Uh, world's insane and I just need to rule it kind of a thing. But on the surface, you can kind of see that there is a form of logic to it. Now, there was a lot of warning signs, we'll say. Something was up and a lot of characters knew it. They knew uh, there were just like fell winds in the air, all kinds of one might say malign portents, which of course became the name of a expansion campaign later on for this exact time frame. But there was a lot of understanding that like something's not right, but we don't quite know what, right? Because Nagash had not fully revealed his hand at first. He actually began his ritual with a construction project. 
and this was what's called the Black Pyramid. Now there's actually multiple Black Pyramids in the lore, but there was one grand one. Um, and so this grand one is located in Nagashazar, and it is essentially a funnel, okay? The idea of Nagash to do this great big spell was to take all the death magic that naturally occurs in the realms, yeah, there might just be like motes of it here and there, uh, near realm gates and such, and bring it into himself so that he could have enough power to successfully do what he wants to do with the spell. It's all about energy. So he uh, spends forever building this uh, black pyramid and it's built one grain of sand at a time, literally speaking, because it's made out of pure realm stone in Hayish, or sorry, Shayish, uh, realm of death. And so uh, basically he has this ant line of skeletons going from the very very edge of the realm back with one grain of um realm stone from shayish at a time sometimes the you know little zombies or skeletons would explode because it was carrying so much power and they would have to be replaced and that kind of stuff but it just went on for forever now at this time Nagash was actually asleep for most of this construction period because he got punked by archaeon in the age of chaos so he wakes up, kind of gets a sense of what's going on. He has a great introduction in the Realm Gate Wars. And then all of a sudden, he flips and he's like, nope, um, not going back to the way things are. And he gets ready, his Black Pyramid's constructed. And again, as it's being constructed, it's like broadcasting danger signs to all of nature around it. And finally, he does the spell. Just coming in here for a second coat on this blue. Try not to pull too much black up by accident. Well, at the very last minute of Nagash's, you know, grand spell when all this stuff is going to come to fruition, some Skaven are coming in to the Black Pyramid. They snuck in there, Clan, Escher, spying like they spy, make their way inside the pyramids of Nagash where all of this stuff is going on right as the ritual is just about to begin. And they actually devastate it. So inside this pyramid, it has like etchings and runes and all these crazy arcane symbols from around the world. Well, the Skaven get in there and they start messing with everything. They start chipping away at the walls, you know, trying to steal pieces of what is very important as a material. Like realmstone in general is exceptionally rare and, you know, potent. So they're just trying to take as much as they can. Well, of course, that has dire consequences because the entire thing is basically a giant machine. So you start fiddling with the little minor bits and all of a sudden things start going quite wrong. Nagash does cast the spell, but unfortunately it does not work as intended. See, he only gets half his prize. He does not kill everybody in the realms, which is a bummer. Again, the whole point was to cut off the fuel for the Chaos Gods. That was the idea, but he doesn't get that. Instead, what he does get though is control over those who are already dead in the realms. So, simultaneously, all over the place, huge armies of ghosts and geists and all kinds of creepy stuff pop up and start marching towards Shyish. Realistically, they start attacking anything near them because they don't have much of a consciousness of their own. Um, but the ones who can hear the call of Nagash and they start making their way towards Shyish. And it's at this point that what we know as the army uh, Night Haunt was actually born. It's all of those, I mean, those things existed before and naturally, but now they basically flocked to Nagash's will, consolidated themselves, and he appointed a Mortark, Lady Olander, to lead them. And that's how we have the army. And you might be thinking to yourself, Doug, why are you going into all this detail about what we call the Soul Wars and that kind of thing of Nagash and all this stuff? What does that have to do with Stormcast? Well... This is Sigmar's answer. You see, Nagash had raised the stakes. He basically proclaimed anyone who took and reforged souls, whether that's, you know, the elven gods or uh, certainly Sigmar, he would call him a soul thief all the time. But like, all, anyone who does anything with souls is now an enemy of Nagash, and he set himself as being the arch villain of the second kind of wave of Age of Sigmar stuff. So that's why it matters. When we talk about the um, Sacrosanct Chamber, they are a direct response to what Nagash was doing. And so the two stories are inextricably linked. 
So the Necroquake goes down. There's ghosties all over the place. What is Sigmar's response? Well, he takes the time and the energy to send his greatest, I guess, ghost hunters, ghostbusters, I guess is what you want to call them. Essentially, he has an entire storm host, uh, or sorry, chamber of Stormcast that he hasn't told anybody about. And the reason for that is a bit unclear. He wanted to kind of keep them in the backfield. And also they serve a very special role. You see the sequiturs, no, sorry, not sequiturs, the sacrosanct chambers. I don't know why that's so hard for me to remember that word, sacrosanct. Um, their jobs in general were to run the soul forges or the anvil of apotheosis. I know I'm getting a little messy here, but we'll clean that back up with uh, blue here in a sec when I do my top layer. So they had this like, you know, huge soul cans going on. They got, um, you know, they're reforging Stormcast. They're working the Anvil of Apotheosis. So that's what they've been doing this whole time. We've heard of people uh, working the Anvil, but not really actually known who they were. And so basically Sigmar goes to them, says, you guys are my soldiers who know everything about the nature of the soul. Uh, as far as how it can be wielded as a weapon and or reforged and used and all these kinds of things. You guys are the best. So I'm going to send you down to the realms. And there we have the Sacrosanct Chamber's arrival in Age of Sigmar, starting with the Soul Wars box. Now, they do stand out a little bit different when it comes to them compared to, say, you know, Liberators, Warrior Chamber, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the reason simply is because is every single member of the Sacrosanct Chamber whether they are a sequitur, a castigator, all the different units, every single one of them is a magic user in the lore. Now, not all of them can use them in the game, meaning like sequiturs, for example, they can't cast spells, but they can in the lore at least use in, like their channel, their natural abilities to empower their weapons, which sequiturs can do. You know, it's not a spell, but they're channeling what they have inside of them into their weapon. I believe it's called etheric channeling, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that's probably one of the harder points to, to get over. I think when people saw the sacrosanct stuff, they were like, okay, but where have they been, right? And the idea that they had a job that they had been seeing to and now they've been taken away from it was actually a really big kind of nail that the last star, uh, Stormcast Battle Tome hit very hard in terms of now there are few, fewer people working the um, Anvil of Apotheosis, and so there is a backup of Stormcast. These warriors who are meant to stay up there and kind of do their job keeping the war effort going, well, they are needed down below now, and so we have a problem. You get this weird sense that they were both, you know, the exact answer to Sigmar's problems in the sense that they knew how to fight this kind of enemy and take it on, that kind of stuff, but also that he didn't really want to give them up. Like, to say that reforging is an important, you know, part of being a Stormcast is a little bit of an understatement. And so, righteously, you know, they are used quite sparingly, but they are used as soldiers now because Nagash raised so many undead things that there's just, there's so much. Like, there's just undead stuff roving around. Some of it has no master because they haven't heard the call of, like, Lady Olander or anything like that. Like, they're just is so much carnage just running around that there's just no one else to to pull upon. And so that's who they are, but let's talk about what they do, right? So we know that they used to run the forges, of course, as I mentioned, but like that's not a job that they actively do now. So what do they what do they bring to the battlefield? Well, uh, they didn't really stop their job. They just kind of changed focus. So it used to be that they would run the Anvil Apotheosis and then you know, look for ways to quote unquote fix uh, the reforging process, meaning Stormcast no longer, you know, degrade every time they're reforged. But they were basically just said, okay, we're going to do that part of our job, but in the mortal realms now so that we can be available to help other people if they so need us. And so now the reason that you and I can play as the Sacrosanct Chamber is because they're actively out in the realms looking for things that could help the research of the reforging process and kind of fine-tune it. You know, the Chaos Gods and uh, now apparently Nagash and uh, Gorka Morka, they're all throwing things at the forces of order and they don't have an answer for it because the reforging is just not going as well as anyone had hoped. 
it's being interfered with a lot. There's ways to kill Stormcast that are permanent, even if, you know, a reforging process is great. There's still an attrition there happening, whether you like it or not. And so this big race to like, how do we fix this, right? How do we fix us is essentially the mission of the Sacrosanct Chamber. And I think probably the most uh, awesome character for embodying that is the named character with absolutely no lore associated with her, which is Astria Soulbright. She gets like a small, I'm going to call it a shout out in the uh, Stormcast book, but essentially she hunts vampires because she's researching how undeath works. How does Nagash infuse death into these creatures so that they don't lose any bit of themselves every single time? But of course, you know, it's kind of a flawed research plan because you're entering into the world of magics that you probably shouldn't know about. So I kind of see the Sacrosanct Chamber as being this force that like, they want to stay in his ear as much as humanly possible, but there are just times when they're needed, right? And so this is actually something that my buddy Jeremy and I are, are enacting with our Path to Glory campaign that we've, you know, run into a huge pile of soul blight grave lords and we're like, man, we just do not know how to tackle this threat. And so they call in help, and that help comes from a rather beleaguered uh, sacrosanct chamber of the Knights Excelsior. Now, as far as what makes them unique when it comes to their fighting style, really it's their ability to channel their natural magic using ability into their weapons, which I didn't realize, like, that's going to have a huge impact. Magical weapons are just traditionally really good against ghost types, right? That's like a pretty common stereotype or trope of fantasy stuff is just, yeah, I mean, ghosts don't like magic. Now, when they added the Sacrosanct Chamber, it was not just like, you know, one or two wizards that they threw in the pot. They threw a ton of things. And I guess that's one thing that I do kind of like is once Sigmar gave the order of like, okay, Sacrosanct Chamber, you're in. He held absolutely nothing back. Obviously, they can come out with models that add to it later on. But I mean, in terms of, you know, what he sent initially, like all of it was very, very significant. So let's talk about those units. The first one, and my favorite, and the one that's on the screen are the Sequitors. These are essentially liberators that are trained in magical crafts and can hone their weapons to a, like a fine point with infused magics. And they kind of make up like the base, you know, warrior of these chambers. If they just have normal squads and they're just trying to go hold a position or reinforce an ally or something like that, typically you're always going to see some Sequitors there. When a Lord Arcanum or, you know, some other leader within the chamber, the Sacrosanct Chamber, says like, hey, I need you guys to get X. Like, you know, the Sequiturs are intelligent enough in the ways of magic and, and basically resources and stuff like that that's used for spells to be able to just kind of go out and enact their will without needing special instructions. Whereas I imagine, you know, every Liberator does not know every arcane artifact in the world and spell lore and all this kinds of stuff. No, 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 no. So this is like almost like a personal guard for them that can, you know, just handle stuff without having to be told special information. There are some super impressive models for them. Uh, that's kind of that was kind of the face, I guess, of the the last big release, Soul Wars. There was a lot of sequiturs in that box. That was the jam, uh, and they were pretty much derided as being just better liberators for a little while, which was, eh, I think, a fair assessment for a bit. But liberators have always had a special place to me. But I understand like the, the idea there, right? Just that they are a baseline troop and they bring everything that the Liberators do to the table, but specialized and focused in magic. Now, next up from these guys, the Sequiturs are the Evocators. Ooh, a little too much on that brush there by accident. That's okay. We're gonna go up and clean up the white anyway once the washes are all done. But the Evocators are an interesting kind of thing because the equivalent, I guess you could say, if they were talking about equivalents in warrior chambers where the sequiturs are liberators, the evocators are definitely paladins, but they don't have the paladin keyword. Like, they function the same way. They are the big, heavy, heavy hitters of the entire sacrosanct chamber. They are much more attuned in the use of magic than sequiturs are, so where sequiturs can just empower their weapons and, you know, kind of amplify whatever it is they're trained in, what kind of art of warfare they have. 
The evocators are actually better in the sense that they can channel that same empowerment to other units around them. Now, they aren't like individually full class wizards. They're not going to go toe to toe with, you know, Kairos or whatever like that. Nothing, nothing of that sort. But they just have this ability to project that same power onto others, which is incredibly useful when you're talking about an army that you know, masters magic and uses it and synergizes its units and that kind of stuff, that's exactly the thing that you want to see. There's that power threshold that allows them to just do more. Now we're going to get messy because we're going to wash everything else. <laughs> um, but the evocators are cool because not only do they come on foot, they also come on the back of a creature that was introduced in the Soul Wars called the Dracoline, which is sort of a cat dragon thing, pounces on you. Um, evocators, not only were they the scourge of tables because, you know, being able to empower your neighbor is a uh, really good ability, but they were also loved because they had this ability, okay, on the tabletop that once all the attacks were done, right, once they finished their combat, they could basically, I, I don't know, electric eel shock whatever they were in combat with. And so you would roll a bunch of dice, do mortal wounds. They still do that. Except that there's just other things that have gotten more ugly in the game in terms of like really, really good rules. And so that doesn't seem as nasty as it used to be. So there's that, you know, they still have that ability. I like it a lot. But they're such an interesting choice because it, it, rather than, you know, going upward on a power scale, like, you know, paladins to liberators do, they kind of just went to the side of like, we're going to focus more on augmenting each other and heavy magics and, you know, exuding the power that we have rather than being a frontline unit like the sequiturs are. After them come the castigators. Castigators are just the ranged troop option and probably the most unusual option, in my opinion, uh, within the Stormcast Eternals battle tome. Now, the reason I say an unusual option not because they're bad. I don't think they are. They're a little three-man unit, which already, there's not a lot of three-man units in, in the army. A um, bunch more were added with the most recent, you know, expansion, but that didn't exist for quite some time. So they're a three-man unit with these bows that they can also channel their power into, much like a sequitur with a gun, basically. They can channel that power into um, the bows and I'm going to use the, the current rules rather than what they initially had, but essentially they can make their arrows hit harder, meaning more impact, so uh, rend, or more accurate, so they rain down terror upon their enemies kind of a thing. Now when you hear about the Sacrosanct Chamber, definitely the next unit that stands out in people's memories if they were around when it first dropped is that of the Celestar Ballista. Now this was an important unit for a single reason. It was actually the first artillery piece that the Stormcast ever got. I think at the time of recording, it still is the only one without dipping into, you know, allies or coalition stuff, that kind of thing. And at the time, people despised this unit because basically folks would put it in the sky, drop it down, and then let it just cause havoc upon their opponents. And it was quite good at that, honestly. Um, it's still a favorite of mine because it just looks menacing. But realistically, the way that it was justified, and I say justified in the lore, you know, the way that they wrote it in was essentially that this thing is a often defensive piece of equipment that was then brought in by the Sacrosanct Chamber because they saw the need for what was going on. I mean, there were just cities that were just being ravaged and overrun and everything like that. And they're like, we need some way to repel these in mass, right? And typically... You know, siege web equipment, that kind of thing. Not your first go-to when it comes to that, but they uh, requisitioned some. And when you can drop anything by lightning, it turns out that uh, being siege equipment doesn't really matter if you can get it anywhere. And so uh, we had ourselves a huge upsurge in the number of uh, Celestar Ballistas that were out and about in the realms. And, you know, honestly, it's kind of strange because, like, all the stories that concern them always take place you know, at defensible positions like cities and that kind of stuff, but they really do show up when the Sacrosanct Chamber does. It makes you think that they are somehow related to ghost hunting, even though they don't seem to be rules-wise. It's an interesting thing. Beyond that, we were introduced to a few new characters. Uh, we had the Lord Imperitant, um, 
no wait, Lord, Knight and Cantor. There we go. Oh my gosh, they all sound the same, don't they? Um, we had a Knight and Cantor come in the Soul Wars box as well. That's your wizard that has a once per game auto unbind spell, which is a terrific rule. So they're pretty sweet. Um, then we also had the, the Lord Arcanum, which was the uh, sort of hero that kind of shepherded and led the Knights and Cantor. And essentially their role is they are the magic masters of this army. They are really meant to represent that of like, not necessarily battle mages per se, but just scholarly researchers who are desperately trying to figure out how do we stop our Stormcast brothers and sisters from coming back all kinds of weird and messed up. And those are certainly like the, the big ones, right? I mean, we've had references since Soul Wars began of various characters and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the popular ones, I won't spoil who it's referencing, but it is a old world character from the book Soul Wars that uh, is a fan fave. And that's honestly one of my favorite, you know, shout outs uh, that's happened from the old world. You know, we have just a bunch of cool characters that are all centered around one thing that magic and the ethereal has gotten out of control. Because if I didn't emphasize it enough, Nagash really messed a lot of stuff up when he did his big spell. He essentially destabilized magic and so Sigmar's only real course of action was to go out and send a whole bunch of magic experts to be like, how do we fix this, right? And I understand. But I also really like that they're not trying to be this entire, you know, one man wrecking crew army. Like they're, they're an arm. They're an arm of something bigger than them. And so they do conform very, very well with just about any Stormcast force because they are there typically for a specific reason. So they're like, you know, okay, you know, Vandis or whoever the Stormcast leader is at the moment, you go off, do your thing. We are going to focus on the magic thing that we came here to deal with. So they do have their own structure, their own, you know, priority list, that kind of stuff. And I like that kind of thing because it adds resources to an army. You know, they can all call in sacrosanct stuff, but it does give them a unique personality within it. Now, as far as some personal favorite things that involve the sacrosanct chamber as a whole, uh, I've already mentioned it, but I'm going to repeat it. The book Soul Wars, if you are interested in what this sub-faction is like, and I call it a sub-faction, it's an arm of an existing army. There's no, you know, specific chamber sub-faction. But if you want to learn more about how the Sacrosync Chamber acts and looks, there it really is no better place than, than Soul Wars. And the reason for that is not only do you get a sense of what the Sacrosync Chamber is like, but more importantly, you get a sense of what other humans and Stormcasts think of them, which is an important and, and big distinction. So, you know, you have your typical things, like you have certain heroes that you follow, and you get to see them back in Sigmaron, and, and basically trying really hard to, like, you know, I don't want to leave, I still have work to do, but then Sigmar calls you away, so how do you argue? But man, once they get down to the realms, like, where the real story starts and picks up, like, other Stormcasts look at them and, like, don't like them very much. Um, part of it is, you know, it reminds them of the worst parts of being a Stormcast. These are the people who have been reforging you. It's a very understandable, like, you know, uh, yeah, I don't want to be around you too much. You remind me of bad things. <laughs> uh, which is a little unfair, but also somehow also totally legit at the same time. And so they have that kind of tension going on, but also, like, even just the manner of which they conduct themselves, you know, um, their priorities of arcane over everything else is very interesting. Also keep in mind that since the Sacrosanct Chamber has come down to the realms and is actively like working alongside, you know, various Stormcast armies, they've kind of taken on this role as an inquisition. So what I mean by Inquisition is, you know, as, as Stormcast are being reforged and now that there's fewer people working, said forges, mistakes are happening. Stormcast are coming back either with memories so depleted they shouldn't be returned. They should just kind of sit like in a cairn up in Azir until we can figure out how to fix souls and that kind of stuff. Um, they're coming back just more aggressive in some instances. They're coming back more not timid in others, but inhuman. Like they don't respond, they can't speak or stuff like that. Just all kinds of strange quirks of the reforging process. Now, one thing I've always loved is that the best book to learn about how Stormcasts view the Sacrosanct Chamber, or should I say other Stormcasts view their own Sacrosanct Chamber, actually comes from a strange place that I didn't expect it to. And that is the book 
uh, Black Talon First Mark. Okay, this was a book that was put out a while ago. We actually did a book club on it, and it follows the story of One Knight Zephyros, uh, which is basically Sigmar's assassin from the Vanguard uh, chamber. Which So you're like, totally different chamber. What does it have to do with anything? Well, Neve Black Talon has visions. She has visions, importance of the future. She doesn't know what to make of them. And she's sitting at a campfire one night with other Stormcast, and they're all talking about Vandis Hammerhand. He is a famous Hammer of Sigmar. He also is known to have foresight as an ability, whether it's a hiccup of the flaw or just something in his soul. Sorry, his soul. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but as they're talking about it, she gets incredibly nervous, not of some chaos force or what that might mean, but of the Sacrosanct Chamber looking at her and saying there's something not right here like something about neve is an aberration and we need to get rid of it and so then she's kind of scared of like you know what if i went through all of this you know all of this pain this torture this you know life of war and it turns out that something happened to me far in the past that made me flawed and i can't be trusted and all of a sudden I go from being, you know, Sigmar's favorite assassin to someone who needs to be put on a leash or kept inside of a jar, basically what the soul cairns are over in his ear. And so it's this interesting thing of like, you have Stormcast who are afraid of their own, you know, members of their own like storm host, because they don't want to know the Stormcast who are part of the Sacrosanct Chamber. They're scared of them. They don't want, you know, don't look at me. I got nothing, nothing to see here. I'm totally normal. I'm... I'm a good soldier boy and or girl. And so it's just an interesting insight into like, these guys are unsettling. And I like that. I love that that has been a consistent theme throughout their story of just, they are the aid that is just necessary sometimes, but with them comes a lot of, uh, I guess, disquiet. A lot of, you know, uncomfortability that I think can add a lot to any story. I love when the heroes like don't necessarily trust each other. Like... When AOS started, it felt like all the Stormcast everywhere were super chummy. <laughs> and then since then, they've kind of walked it back to be like, no, some of these guys are terrifying to one another, and I love it. Because I think it's that internal conflict that really makes armies interesting, right? Having everyone get along always and be on the same page, not only is it like... I feel like that's just as much high fantasy as dragons and stuff, right? It's just not how people work. If this were like, you know, 40k speak, they would be sort of like the commissars, I guess. No, not really, but in the sense of making sure that everyone is there doing their job precisely as they are told how to do it. That is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And so with them, it's interesting because they don't necessarily have any like written authority. Like we don't have like a hierarchy chart that puts, you know, Lord Arcanum above anybody else but it's just interesting that they have this capacity you know sigmar has given them the job of like you need to look at all of my creations and weed out the ones who don't belong it's like well man that's that's heavy for a monday now what we have learned since all of this has gone down is that magic has kind of chilled out um Teclis went in and punched nagash around a bit and they got into a, a nerd fight up in hish and essentially, it seems like the, the Soul Wars are pretty much over. Um, Nagash is firmly lost, like his bid for power is done. Uh, between the forces of chaos, forces of order, and destruction, nobody let him be in charge utterly and completely, which is good. And so it's just this interesting thing of like, well, what now? And so I don't quite know what their role is now other than continuing to, you know, try and find a cure, which uh, I'm thinking is a fool's errand, but... Um, they're trying. They're trying their best. And I can't fault them for that. They're trying their best to find the cure as well as just reinforce whatever is needed. Because there's still pockets of death all over, you know, the realms. Magic is still messed up. That's why we still have endless spells. So there's stuff for them to need to do, which is good. I mean, everyone should have a role in their army for sure. Uh, and these guys just fill theirs quite well when it comes to being the magic masters. Here we have a completed three foot fabulous looking sequitur. Um, you know, is he the, the strongest paint job? No, probably not, but I like him quite a bit and he matches everything else in my army. It's a very simple paint scheme for that exact reason. I hope you enjoyed learning a bit more about the Sacro, Sacro, bleh. I don't know why I can't say that, Sacrosanct Chamber. 
as we uh, continue to look in more into the Stormcast Eternals battle tome. If you did, let me know what you'd like to hear about next, whether it's a different chamber, like Vanguard Chamber or something like that, uh, Extremist Chamber is another one, Warrior Chamber, all those kinds of things, uh, or if you wanted me to start diving into specific storm hosts or something like that. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I appreciate your feedback on this kind of video, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.